Um, we, uh, so I think today will be our last day in Matthew for the year, all right? So that means we've spent a significant amount of our year uh, getting through Matthew. I thought we might finish Matthew 7 and kick off the new year in Matthew 8, but we are not finishing Matthew 7 today. Um, but uh, I do want to give a, a quick thanks to Christian uh, for covering for me last week. Um, give him a hand. He did, he did great. Um, so it's like, and, and, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about this church and also about being an associate uh, rather than a lead pastor is that when life is thrown at me, um, there's people here that can back me up and cover for me. And, uh, and so that's huge because I didn't have that, you know, I, I didn't allow myself that at a, in my previous church, and it, and it cost me. And so I really appreciate what you guys, um, you do for me here, all right? Um, so in, in Matthew chapter 7, Christian kicked off with it. And, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to briefly go over what, what, um, what Christian mentioned, because verse 7, um, ver, yeah, let me make sure that's right. Verse 6, I'm sorry. So if you're following along, verse 6 is closely tied to the first five verses. Um, and so I want, so I can't just, but I didn't want to skip verse 6. I thought about skipping verse 6, but if you're following along with me in your Bible, and because it's a weird passage, um, that if, you, if you're like, why did he skip that? That's how I would think. Like, why did you skip that? So I didn't want to skip that. So I got to go back just real quick to cover a little bit of what Christian did last week um, so that if you weren't here, you, you kind of know what we're going to get into. So, um, so let's just start from chapter 7, verse 1. And I'm going to read through uh, last week's passage. So it says, Do not judge, so that you may not be judged. For the judgment you will be, um, for the judgment you give will be the judgment you get. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or, or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's. And so I appreciate what Christian said about this, where it was like, it's kind of a negative lesson in, um, in reaping and in sowing and reaping, right? It's like you, you're going to get whatever you put out into the world, um, y- you also see come up in your own life. And, and it's a good thing to know, right? Because then maybe you'll focus a little bit or, or be aware of the things that we put into the world. Right, because those things do come come back. You reap and you sow, and it's and so it's a, it's a lesson in in life there. And so that was that was really good. And so the thing there is too, though. But we have a responsibility. So so sometimes you'll read this and you go, well, I'm not supposed I'm not supposed to like you know the specs I have the log. The idea is no, no, no. It's supposed to get the log out of your eyes so that you can help. Right, so that you can you can help. And and that's where this this passage kind of. Um, leads into this this really weird phrase or weird weird verse um, verse six and uh, in verse six it says this um, do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you um, so so if the previous um, if, if the previous passage was about making sure that we are able to help, right, that, but we help in a non-judgmental and, um, in a, in a non, non-judgmental and, I had the right word for this, competent, non-judgmental in a competent way, like that's how we're supposed to help each other, right, so don't judge when we're helping and do it competently, which means you've removed your, the log from your eye, right, so if, if that's what that first section is about, the second section is he's calling, and he's not calling people pigs or dogs, right? So we're just, just so we're on the same page, right? Um, it's a warning. It's a warning about, I mean, my, uh, my middle kid, um, Cadence, was a, uh, a lifeguard for a, couple, for a couple summers. I'm gonna try to put it to you this way. So when they teach you how to save someone from drowning, do you know how they do? They, so they try to tell you, like, if they're panicking, that you don't, uh, you got to kind of come out with your feet, right? Because <laughs> you're not going to launch on. Because what happens is if they're panicking and they drown you, um, you're not going to help them, right? <laughs> right? And so you have to come at them. So, like, if there's two options, you drown or we both drown, you're going to drown, 
right? And that's harsh, right? But there's, but there's a reality to that. And so, so there's a part of what Jesus is saying is like, you have a responsibility to help, but if someone doesn't want your help, that's what this is, right? If someone doesn't want your help, and you're reaching your hand out to them, and they're not taking it, then you have to kind of, you have to reach out towards someone else then, right? Because what, what happens is you will just, you will get wasted away. You will get tear, torn down. You will get trampled. Like, that's what it's saying here, right? You're, you're trying to be helpful, but you're just getting rejected. And, and you can try and try and try, but at some point, if someone doesn't want help, uh, you have to walk away. And so Jesus, I know, listen, Jesus doesn't always say, like, like these are like harsh, these are tough things, right? Um, in Matthew 8, which we'll get to next year, he says, um, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> in Matthew 8, he says, um, someone wants to follow me, he says, go and bear, let the dead bury their own dead and come follow me. Like, that's, that's a tough statement. But what does that say? It's like, sometimes you have to move on. Sometimes you have to get up and go help the next person. And, uh, and so that, that's a, it's a harsh reality, but it's about saving yourself. He's like, I definitely want you to help each other. But if someone's not willing to take it, then you have to find someone else to help. Um, and so that's, that's that one weird verse in there that I want to make sure that we, that we covered because I thought it was interesting. Um, so the next session, the next section was described by Frederick Bruner as one of the three deep springs along the path that is the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, so I wonder how many people here have would say been here for most of the Sermon on the Mount sermons, like most of them, right? So how many here would say it's, it's an easy road to travel? One, right. I knew he would raise his hand. Uh, it, it's, right, it's, it's not a, you know, it's, it, it's, we, we've been talking about, it's like, you know, anger is murder, and, you know, when you're helping people, don't let people know, and, right, there's, and, and, and fasting and prayer, and, like, there's all these things that, that we're kind of called to to be these kingdom people, and it's, and it's not an easy road, right? But what happens is there's these pockets, he called them kind of wells, I call them pockets of grace uh, within the sermon, because there's, uh, the sermon's tough on its own. The Sermon on the Mount is a, it's a tough word, but it begins with what? The Beatitudes, right? It's like, hey, we're going to get into something just so you know at the beginning of this thing, God is for you, right? That's the Beatitudes, right? It was God is for uh, the meek and the, um, the peacemakers and, and all these, so he starts off with this kind of graceful, like, hey, God is for you, and then he really gets into some, some deep stuff, right? We covered that through, through Matthew 5, and then in the Matthew 6, there's another pocket of grace where it was like the Lord's Prayer, right? It was like, forgive us our trespasses and, um, you know, and, and, and give us what we need, right? And, 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 and let your kingdom come. And it, it's, so it's a little bit of a break, right, from this, ah, you're going to do this, you got to do this, we're going to do this. And, and, then, and then he kind of goes into some more things. So then there's this next pocket that we're in right now of grace where it's like, you know, how do I do all of this stuff, God? Right, you, you've kind of given us, the, you know, these two chapters of, of things that you're calling us to that aren't easy. It's like, how do I do it? Like, how do I accomplish this? How do we become these people? And so verse 7 says this. Ask. It says, ask. Ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Um. So the knee-jerk reaction here is to be like, that doesn't work. <laughs> right? The knee-jerk reaction is like, okay, well, maybe it works for you, but it doesn't work for me because I've asked for plenty of things and haven't gotten them. Right? I've knocked on plenty of doors, asked for plenty of jobs, or, or wanted all these things, and I haven't gotten them. So like, like, what's, that's the, kind of the knee-jerk reaction. Right? It's like, what is this? Because it, it sounds good. Right? It sounds great. Yeah, just you know, keep trying. It'll all work out. It's like, is that what, it's, is that what he's talking about? Um, and, and, and here's the thing Jesus is not concerned like Matthew's Jesus is not concerned with you misinterpreting this which is weird like because I would wish you would kind of be like clarify that because it seems like it's like it's not working and, and it can get abused right because who's heard of like name it claim it uh, prosperity preachers anybody not you, just, you guys are staying away from televangelists apparently yeah that's good uh, <laughs> so like so um so so if good you're not familiar with this so so essentially like someone will get up on the tv right and they'll, they'll say I see a thousand dollars in your future 
There's a telephone number at the bottom of your screen if you'll sow $100 into this ministry. Right? That's, you, 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 it'll come to you, right? And it's like that, that's the, the prosperity gospel, this idea that this is all supposed to, to go great for you and you're just not trying hard enough. You're just not claiming it. You got to claim that $1,000 with your $100, please. <sighs> Listen, the, the greatest antidote to the prosperity gospel, which that's what that is. That's called the prosperity gospel. The greatest antidote is reading your Bible. And it's true. Because, listen, how come John the Baptist got beheaded? Right? Why did Paul die a prisoner of the state? Why was Peter, and you go extra biblical, why was, why was Peter crucified upside down? Why was... Uh, the apostle John boiled alive and exiled on an island, right? Jesus is the anti-prosperity preacher. He is the anti-prosperity preacher. He literally said it's hard for rich people to get into the kingdom of God, uh, God right? Like that's what he said. Um, so it's, it's laying down your life. It's laying down your life. It's taking up your cross. It's leaving comfort and familiarity. Like that's what Jesus calls us to, right? It's, so it's not... It's not give so that I can get. It's get so that I can give. And, and, and that's, what we're, that's what Jesus is calling to, right? Like, go get what you can so that we can bless the world. Not, not try to grab every blessing for yourself. And, and so that's what's going on there. I think Jesus is speaking or right into that. Um, and then, so, so if we go back to the past, so what does it mean, though? Ask, seek, knock. Like, what do we do with that? So if you go to James, uh, the, the brother of Jesus, he speaks um, directly into this, uh, actually. It almost feels like, like they were, it almost feels like you're reading this from James and he goes, that someone had wrote to James that says, hey, hey, Jesus said if we ask, seek, and knock, we're going to get it. And then James is like, let me, let me clarify some things. So in G James 4, verse 2, it says this. Um, you want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and you cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. And we're like, no, that's what we're asking about. We're trying to figure this out. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. Right? So there's a right way to ask now. It's not just asking not, but it's do it correctly, is what James is saying. He's like, you've been doing it, but you're doing it wrong. You've been doing it for the wrong things, for the wrong things. Right? It's like you want the wrong things so you can do the wrong things. That's not what this is about. It says you ask, you not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasure and so james is like this i know jesus said to ask and you'll get it but you're missing the point you're missing the point the asking isn't about getting more it's about this is it it's about being more not about getting more it's about being more um you're asking for the wrong things for the wrong things and so then the question is well how do i know what the right things are to ask for right it, like you already talk, what is how do i know what to ask for and um, there's a, uh, one of my favorite uh, psychologists, I don't know if you have a favorite psychologist, um, <laughs> Jordan Peterson, uh, he, he wrote a book, uh, The Twelve Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, and it is, uh, for me, it was, it was a life-saving book. But um, in, in rule number two, he says that, he says, treat yourself like someone worth, um, was it? treat yourself like someone worthy of being treated well. And it's like, that's weird. Like, what does that mean? So think about it this way. If your pet gets sick and you take it to the vet and it gives you a prescription, you are more likely to fill that prescription and give it to your pet than you are yourself if you're sick. Is that weird? I mean, you could think about that for a long time, right? It's like we don't, we might want to say that we value ourselves, but like I miss medications all the time, but like my dog wouldn't, right? You know what I mean? It's like these things, like, cause I just, what is that? It's like, well, I don't treat myself. I don't care maybe about myself actually, if we go by action, not what we think, but the way I treat myself is not, you, so you have to be able to exit yourself and look at your life and, and, and coach, imagine if you were coaching yourself. You say, hey, what, is, what does Carson need to be more like Jesus? Right, because you, you don't know. I know. I'm well aware, Right? But so, so at some point, I say this all the time, you've got to sit down on your bed and say, God, what is it that I'm doing that's stupid? We do stupid things. 
Is there something in my life that I could stop doing that's stupid that is messing with my life? That's not allowing me to be the person or that's stopping me short from being the person that I could be or that you called me to be or created me to be? What is it that I'm doing that's stupid? What could I be doing better? And, and, but here's the thing, you have to actually ask. Like, not like, God, you know, we just, every day I wake up and I say, make sure I don't do anything stupid. It's like, well, no, you, you still will, right? You're human. Uh, but, but it's seeking with all your heart, and that's the, the Jeremiah 29, 13 passage, right? I know Jeremiah 29, 11 is the famous one, but if you go two more, the whole chapter is good, but we can't do that today, right? So he says, when you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all of your heart, right? There's a, there's, there's a, a, all of your heart piece to that. And so it's, again, so James has said that there's a right way to do it, and then Jeremiah is like, there's a passionate way to do it, right? There's, it's all with all your heart, and it's asking for the right things. Uh, and then if you go back to James, James 1, uh, this is a the great passage to memorize. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God, who gives the all generously and un grudgingly and it will be given to you but ask in faith never doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind and, and so when we when we're trying to find out who god's calling us to be right because it's not about getting something about being someone like god's calling us to be kingdom people that's what this whole sermon on the mount's about so it's like how do i become that person we got to ask god to show it to you and you have to but you have to do it with your heart and you have to do it passionately you have to believe that he's going to give you the answer and then you have to actually do it right that's the hard part is actually doing it and so and so so let's let's take a deep everyone take a deep breath we're going to regroup here for a second right because we've we've got some things we've got to cover so we if you were here two weeks ago we we had our aim we talked about aim uh like what is it that we're, we're called to do and we said seek ye first right the King James comes out and seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? And all things will be given unto you. We said that. And so aim at the greatest good you can imagine. Shine the brightest light that you can in the darkest places that you can possibly manage, right? That's, that's what we said is, is aiming at the kingdom of God. And so then the asking and seeking is, okay, I have my aim, Whatever you decided your aim was, I have my aim, so now God, give me what I need to go after that, right? Give me what I need to, to, to know what to do or how to do it or how to do it well. It's like, show me those things. That's the prayer. That's the asking and seeking on. It's like, God, I know you have something for me, right? You know what? I know you have, like, something I'm supposed to do in this world. It's like, just keep knocking. Like, those are the doors that we're talking about opening because they open towards a better you in Christ. And those are doors that, that, that we want to open. Um, and, and that's how verse 9 kind of lays it out, if you know verse 9. It says, Is there anyone among you, if your child asked for bread, would give you a stone? Or if the child asked for a fish, would give a snake? And, and here's the thing, too, that children actually sometimes ask for snakes and don't know it. Right? Um, one of my kids, like a year ago, um, I was, I don't know, I was sitting on the, I was sitting on the, uh, the couch watching TV and I heard one of them yell down from upstairs because we so well, the way our house is situated super convenient instead of having conversations you can just scream from one level to the other right are you familiar this is great um, so 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 someone yells down from upstairs dad do uh do we have another TV I thought what are you gonna do with two TVs you know and uh, and I go well this one stopped working I was like, okay, well, what's wrong with it? And, well, the screen just stopped. What do you mean the screen just stopped? Was, well, something hit it. I thought, what, you, well, what was it? It's like, my remote. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, did you throw your remote at the TV? Yes. No, I don't have an extra TV. <laughs> right? Right? Because I could, right? I, but I, I could get one. Right? But it's like to immediately replace the TV... Um, you know, it's, it's, you're asking for a snake, right? It's like, even if it's something that I want you to have, which obviously I do because I bought the original ones, right? It's like, I want you to have these things. So, so, it's, so sometimes we, the things that we ask for are not the things that are good for us, right? And that's one of the things that the Father understands, right? And so when we, when, when, when we go to God, it's like, I want this, or I want to be this, or I want to have this. He's going, like, those are actually good things, but for you right now, they're not. 
right? You're not in a space right now to have those things. And so that's part of being a parent. That's part of being a child of God. It's trusting that when it's a no, it's a, it could be a not yet, right? It, it, or, but it, it's, if it's not now, God says, it, well, it's not, it's not good for you at this moment. Um, and uh, so then <laughs> in verse 11, Jesus goes on. He says, if you then who are evil... And I thought, that's harsh. Like, why does, why does God call them evil, or us evil? Uh, I was like, you could have used selfish, seems better. I would have preferred selfish, or, or something not e- that's not evil, right? That seems like a, so why is it, <clears throat> and you might disagree with me on this point, and that's fine, because um, this actually flies in the face of a culture, uh, of a Christian culture, that says, I'm worthy of God's love. All right, like, bear with me, right? So it's like, so the gospel is not, you have been so good, and you're so cute, and you're so nice, that God was like, I'm going to die for you. That's not the gospel. But if you, if you pay attention and you listen, that's a lot of people's gospels. It's like, I'm, I'm good. <sighs> Maybe you do good things. I hope you do good things. But the gospel is that while you were enemies of God, Christ died for you, right? That we were, we couldn't, what we couldn't do for ourselves, Christ did for us, right? That's, that's the gospel, that we needed him. Like, we, we needed new life. We needed a resurrection. Like, we, the, that's the gospel. And so there's this, there's this, so Jesus says you're evil because he's like, you, you are. Think about a baby, you wouldn't call a baby evil. Are they not the most selfish things ever created? They don't care about your sleep, right? They, they, they provide nothing to the economy, right? They, they clean up nothing, and all it is is feed me, clean me. Feed me, clean me. Feed me, clean me. For like 20 years, <laughs> right? But it's, it's, but it's, 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 but if you don't, literally part of the parent, a parent's job is what? To remove, is, is to form this selfish, non-producing, you know, creature into something that's fully functioning and able to, to love and, and be competent and be courageous and, and do all these things. And so, like, if, if you just left a baby with none of that, even if it could possibly grow, which the, it's, it's a very unhealthy, there's experiments back a long time, you don't want to even look at them. Um, if you do not grow, you remain selfish. You remain entitled. You remain all these things. You remain about you, right? And so you, we're always trying to move ourselves and our children out of that, and God's always trying to move us out of that. So to say, man, I'm, I'm good, compared to who? Every time someone says, I'm good, they always go, I didn't kill anybody. Is that not the first thing they say? I've never killed, I don't rob people. Right? It's like, that's the bar for good. Like, that's not even a good bar, right? That's a low, low bar. This isn't a part of the sermon. We gotta keep going. <laughs> if you, then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And so I think Jesus is getting at the core of sin here, um, that to some degree. So if, if you go back to Genesis 3, which is the story of the entrance of sin, right? Um, there's, there's Adam and Eve, right? This is a familiar story. You've done this coloring book, right? There's, there's Adam and Eve, and there's the tree in the center of the garden. He's like, don't eat from the one tree. Like, where is that tree? In the center. It's like, why did you put it in the center? It's like, well, the real question is like, because poor choices are always within reach. That's, that's the reality of it, right? And, and so, so, so there's this tree. It's like, don't eat from the tree. And do you remember what the serpent says uh, to the woman? Uh, let's just, Genesis 2, 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, excuse me, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. And here's the temptation. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened 
and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And so the temptation is the same temptation that I think is at the root of all sin. I'm going to say most, just for argument's sake, but I think it might be at the root of all sin. This idea that I know what's better for me than God. Right? That, that I, I know the better thing to do. I know the right thing. I, or, or I can get away with it. Oh, everyone else can't. Right? It's like, I, I've got this handled. I know me. And I've said this over and over. No one has lied to you or let you down or hurt you more than you've hurt yourself. Right? I mean, over and over again. And so you are not a great Lord of your own life. Right? And so, but that's what the temptation of all sin is. Like, I know it's not right, but I think I can get away with it. I think I'll be okay. I would never tell someone else, and this is how you know. It's like, because I would never encourage someone else to do this. But I'm going to get away with it. That's, that's at the core of a lot of sin, is, is self, self-deception. Um, and so there's this fear that if we, and I had this fear growing up, there's this fear that if I give God my all, if I give God everything, if I fully commit my life to him, that he's going to send me overseas. No one thought that? I thought that growing up, because that's where all the committed Christians were. I thought they were all missionaries, right? I thought, every, and so I was like, man, I don't want to be a missionary. But, w- but what you find out is that I'm, you end up being a missionary anyway, just to a different community. But, but listen, God does not want to send you into something, give you a vocation into something that you don't want to do that you're not passionate about. Have you ever sent a kid to do something they're not passionate about? You end up doing it yourself anyway. Right? So it's like God's not sending us into these spaces going like, if you're not not qualified or want to do them, and so you don't need to be afraid of that. God's not going to give you a gift you don't want. Right? You ever put the wrong name tag on a a gift Christmas? Like you swap two, and like you both open them, you go, actually, those are for each other. Right? Because they're both good gifts, but only because they're for the, but they have to be for the right person. Right? And so that's where we're being called into when we're, when, we're in, when we're giving to God. We're going, God's going to give you the right gift. He's going to give you a good gift. Because that's what God does. That's what a good father does. And so the aim then, the aim. When, when, I, when I talk about aiming at the greatest good that you can achieve, when I, when I talk about shining the brightest light into the darkest spaces that you can manage, it should always be found at the crosshairs of passion and giftedness passion and giftedness um that that's john 10 right that john 10 10 says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy i came that you may have life and have it abundantly i'm the good shepherd the good chapter good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep and so listen you will never feel more alive than when you're doing something good that uses your passion and your giftedness I mean, when you, it's called the sweet spot, right? I mean, that's when you know what you're doing. And I'm not telling people, I'm not saying you, you got to quit your job or you got to do all these things. I'm saying find something. Aim at something good, whatever you can manage uh, to do good. Like, um, there's area, are there areas in your life? And here's where you got to go. Because sometimes you're sitting there going, I'm busy. I'm too busy to do something else. And so, to some degree, we have to ask ourselves, is there someone, or is there something in our lives that we're giving pearls to swine? Where I'm going, I'm putting a lot of energy into this, and there's nothing coming out of it. There's nothing coming out of it. And it's it's destroying me. It is taking all of my heart and soul, and I'm getting nothing out of it. Is that, so is there something you need to walk away from, maybe, so that you can find a dark place to shine a light? Um, you know, over and over, sometimes I feel I just preach the same sermon every week, but you got to find what breaks your heart. Like, if you want to do that, when you start finding passion and giftedness, it's that it, there's a, you got to ask God, what is it that breaks my heart? Um, you know, there's multiple times, story after story of, you know, I got, I got down from, um, I, you know, I met with one woman one time after, after a sermon. They were new to, a, new to the church, and uh, she said, I just, um, I just have a heart for, for, for babies whose, whose moms are sick. And, uh, and so she just decided, she got a couple friends, and they just started going to the hospitals and, and just rocking babies, mm-hmm. you know? Like, that's, that's a dark space that needed light shown into it. Um, you know, my, my wife one time just wanted to make sandwiches for people living in tents in the woods. 
right? Three years later, it was maybe one of the, the, the most active homeless outreaches in the city. But, but it just started with a sandwich, right? It was, started with just rocking a baby. Um, and I've told you about, someone asked me about a clothing pantry. I gave him like the smallest space I had, the only space I had. Three years later, the largest free clothing pantry in Lorain County. It's, it's just people going, and I had nothing to do with it except say, do it, <laughs> right? Like, that's all I did. I just, yeah, let's do it. Um, but it was people who, who found something that broke their heart and wanted to do something about it, wanted to shine a light into a dark space. And I, and it, I had one lady come down after a sermon on children's ministry. She said, I want to quit my job and volunteer full-time as, as your children's minister. I was like, are you qualified? <laughs> you know, make sure she's qualified. <laughs> yes, right? It was like, but these are the things. Like, you're talking about shining. It's because people saw something that they wanted to do that broke their heart, but they also used their giftedness and their passion about in, in attacking it. And that's, that's what we're called to, to be. But listen, find out what breaks your heart. Take the largest step you can manage. And that could be a baby step. The biggest step you can manage could be just a small baby step. But it might not be. It might be quitting a job. It might be doing something crazy, which is fine. It could be as small as rocking a baby or working in the nursery. But listen, if you don't ask, if you don't knock, those doors just don't open. God bless you, church.